Jury selection began Monday in a brand new trial out of Illinois in a tragic case from November 2020. Defendant Matthew Pody is accused of killing his pregnant girlfriend and setting her house on fire to conceal the crime. According to police, victim Melissa Lamiche was just days away from giving birth when she was found dead on her kitchen floor. During the initial investigation, it was believed that Lamiche died from asphyxiation related to the house fire. Over a year later, Pody was arrested after police believed that the pregnant woman actually died by strangulation before her house was set ablaze. Pody is facing a slew of charges, including three counts of first-degree murder, one count of premeditated first-degree murder, three counts of intentional homicide of an unborn child, concealment of a homicidal death, residential arson, and aggravated domestic battery, a slew of charges, as I said. If convicted, Pody faces a life in prison without parole. Let's bring in our guest trial attorney and federal litigator, Robin Dunn, and also, or Nunn, sorry, and criminal defense attorney, Paul Townsend. I always do that to you, Robin. <laughs> Let's break this down. Robin, I'll turn to you first. What's even more tragic about this case is that the defendant was actually a volunteer firefighter. And that actually is something that makes you pause and think. He knows about arson. How does that affect, I think, this trial, the fact that there was a fire involved here? Yeah, the facts of this case are already pretty horrific, with a pregnant woman near delivery in a few days being strangled in her home, which is then lit on fire. But to add to that story, we have the fact that this is a firefighter who indeed set this blaze, potentially, and is accused of murdering his EMT girlfriend who he works with on the job. So I think the facts are so gruesome that it will impact the eventual jury. Exactly. And Paul, let me turn to you. What is each side looking for in a jury here? They're picking a jury and they've got a jury and they want to make sure that this jury is going to look at the case from their own perspective. So what is the defense looking for? What is the prosecution looking for? Well, let's start with what the prosecution is looking for, because I think that's an easier question to answer. Um, literally anybody with a pulse. Uh, th these facts are so horrific um, that, that that's obviously a, a not quite a serious answer. What what you're looking for if you're the prosecutor is uh, is a, f a parent with a young child, um, somebody who is going to look at this uh, this pregnant woman who is very close to the delivery um, and, and be emotionally roused because they have young children of their own, um, somebody uh, who who is um, kind of a more uh, kind of rules minded person who's going to look and say, you know, this is a firefighter. He has a duty um, to protect people. And he violated that sacred duty with a partner of his who is uh, uh, ostensibly carrying his child. Um, if you're the defense, this is a tough ask. Um, you want somebody who's going to be slightly emotionally detached from this. You want somebody who uh, is going to be um, kind of critical of the evidence and will kind of make a dispassionate uh, decision here. You don't want somebody who's going to be overly emotionally invested, because if that's the case, there's not much that can be done for this guy. So you're really going to want somebody who's kind of a, a, a you know, a, a non-emotional entity, that's the best you're going to get. Exactly. And Robin, let me ask you, one of the things about this case that also makes it so horrific, it must have been, if in fact he has done this murder, premeditated. He must have thought out about how he is going to strangle her versus shooting her with a gun or some other way that would leave evidence that she was murdered. So it was strangulation and then the fire and then the smoke put her out. It's something that you'd really have to think long and hard about, correct? Correct, exactly. It's very clear that this is something that was premeditated now. Initially, they did think that she may have died of asphyxiation due to the fire. Um, as a firefighter, that's something that the defendant may have took into consideration in planning this crime. The reason why this defendant is facing so many serious charges, facing life imprisonment, meant is because of, if it is true, the forensic evidence that this person was indeed deceased at the time of the fire was set, that would lead one to believe that this was very, very intentional and designed to cover up the murder. Exactly. And Paul, what do you think about the witnesses that may be coming forth here? 
what do you think about who the prosecution is going to call? One of the things I'm thinking is, are they going to call other firefighters to say what type of person he was, whether the defense calls the other firefighters or the prosecution? You think that's a possibility? So the prosecution's not going to be allowed to put the defendant's character um, at issue unless the defendant does first. If if uh, if Plody has witnesses come on and testify that he's such a great guy, he'd never do something like this, he's such a gentle, caring soul, then that opens the door and the prosecutor can put on witnesses to say, no, uh, he's a belligerent, violent, you know, domestic abuser. Um, I think one of the big witnesses that you're going to see in this case by the prosecution is going to be the medical examiner, because it makes such a difference if this was strangulation pre-fire uh, setting as opposed to asphyxiation from the smoke of the fire. Um, if it's strangulation and then a fire is set, you know, that's much more indicative that the fire was to cover up the fact that the woman had been strangled, which is, you know, not a natural cause of death by any stretch. So that I think is going to be a key witness for the prosecution. Um, I think you're going to also maybe get some firefighters to testify about the fire itself if they can show that the fire was intentionally caused as opposed to, you know, faulty wire or an accident, that is also going to play, I think, a big role in determining whether or not this was intentionally done. Exactly. And also, if, in fact, he was supposed to be on duty and he wasn't there, he was at the house, he was setting the fire, I mean, those types of things could come into question. Robin, you know, one other thing, obviously, the prosecution does not have to show motive. But what would the prosecution want to establish here saying that the defendant actually committed murder? Wouldn't they have to have some sort of theory to sort of tie this all together? Yeah, I think that they are have received some evidence that he was at the home. They did do a pre-interrogation of him where he admitted that he was indeed present at the home shortly before the murder. So I think that they do have some information that he was engaged, and I think that that is contributing to them charging him, in fact, with this crime. Exactly. And Paul, do you think that if they can't establish a motive, they could prevail, the prosecution could possibly prevail on any sort of circumstantial evidence? You mentioned before the fact that the medical examiner is very important, and I agree with that. If it is determined that she died from smoke inhalation, that's a very different situation than if she died from some other method. Sure. You can prove a murder, you can prove a homicide without motive. Um, it is certainly more difficult to do. As human beings, we naturally want that kind of closure on the story. We want to understand the why of how these things happen. So it's always easier for a prosecutor if they can tie things up in a nice little bow and explain to the jury why exactly the defendant was driven to do this horrific act. But it's certainly not necessary. And there are plenty of times where the facts are so egregious uh, and the evidence is so overwhelming that even if the prosecutor can't say exactly what was going through his mind at the time, the evidence so clearly supports that he is the individual who did this uh, that you can get a conviction even if the prosecutor doesn't have the motive laid out perfectly. Exactly. I think that's absolutely right. And I think that jury is going to be looking at quite a bit of evidence to make a determination in this case one way or the other. Two hearings were scheduled Monday in Allen County, Indiana, surrounding the Delphi murders case. Defendant Richard Allen is charged in the 2017 deaths of two teenagers, Abby Williams and Libby Germain. The pair vanished while on a hike in the Delphi Historic Trails, and their bodies were found in the vicinity the following day. Allen's trial is slated to begin in May, but several issues still need to be addressed ahead of the trial. On Monday morning, the attorneys discuss whether or not prosecutors will be allowed to hit Allen with additional charges in the case. He already faces two counts of murder, which carries a prison sentence of 45 to 65 years. Prosecutors wanted to amend the charges to include two additional counts of kidnapping because they believe it more accurately reflects the discovery information and probable cause affidavit. After hearing arguments from both sides, the judge ultimately dismissed those proposed kidnapping charges. On Monday afternoon, the judge will also decide if Allen's defense team will be held in contempt. Prosecutors filed a motion earlier this year accusing the defense of violating a gag order by issuing a press release proclaiming Allen's innocence back in 2022. 
Another major incident happened in October 2023 when police were notified about an evidence leak from the office of Allen's defense attorney, Andrew Baldwin. Lots going on here. Baldwin said his former employee was behind the leak, which led to crime scene evidence being spread throughout social media. One of the men involved in the leak actually took his own life after being interviewed by police about it. Now, there's a lot to break down in this case, so I'm bringing back in trial attorney and federal litigator Robin Nunn and also criminal defense attorney Paul Townsend to help me break this all down. The judge previously accused the defense attorneys of gross negligence before removing them from the case, but they were later reinstated by the state Supreme Court. How, Paul, could this impact the judge being able to hold them in contempt of court in the present day. It's so much going on, but could the judge hold them in contempt of court here? So there's so much chaos that has been going on in this case. There's so many wild and fantastical claims that have been thrown around. There's so much uh, that, that's been accused, uh, misconduct that's been accused of, of both sides by the other side. Um, but uh, the the interesting thing, these guys thrown off the case, reinstated. This judge clearly does not hold these lawyers in terribly high regard, having thrown them off the case. He is going to be um, very uh, circumspect with regard to them. They're going to be on a short leash. Um, anything that they do that might be perceived um, as a violation of a court order, whether it's a gag order or any other order, um, any ethics uh, complaints that are filed against them by the prosecutors, I think, are going to receive maybe enhanced scrutiny a little bit. Um, I think this judge is going to be very, very careful um, about dealing with them because clearly uh, he has already determined um, that what they have done with this case in, in violating past gag orders and putting out press releases in leaking crime scene uh, photographs and, and evidence is, is a real problem, um, you know, even against the their own clients. It's going to be more difficult for them to get a fair trial with all this stuff coming out from their own side. So yeah, I think this judge is going to to really be on them to make sure that they comply with the strict letter of his orders. Exactly. I mean, there's so much that you said, Paul, that is going on as far as that defense is concerned. And if, in fact, there were leaks and if there was a gag order and they weren't supposed to put out any press releases, the judge is already looking at them as though they've already started behind the eight ball. There's so much that they've done already. Robin, one of the things that I'm thinking about is these kidnapping charges that the judge didn't allow. And, you know, do you think that's the right decision here? I mean, there were the two bodies of the young girls obviously found, sadly, um, after the fact. But why do you think the judge decided, no, I'm not going to allow you to add those charges here? I think the judge had to look at the evidence, had to look at the indictment, had to look at the charging orders and what he had before him prior to the beginning of this trial. Adding new charges onto the trial at this late in the game is difficult. Um, it makes it harder for the prosecutors, and it also makes it harder for the defense to defend against. So I think that the judge was taking what he felt like was the fairest approach and that the information that led to this trial did not warrant a kidnapping charge and therefore he's not gonna allow it. Exactly, and I think it's already a very complicated case, and I think the judge is trying to make it as simple as he possibly can, and this happened so long ago. It's very difficult, something that's already been in the media. I know the judge wants to get this case over with with as little controversy as possible, so perhaps that was the best thing to do, to just leave it already with the charges that the prosecution thought was really drawn out, and thought about very carefully. All right, we have to take a break. We're here now. Please stay with us on Law and Crime. And when we come back, we'll have more. Stay with us.